welcome back to the channel, fellow aviators. Today we are launching a brand new series of tutorials. This is something I've looked forward to doing for quite a while now. In my previous life, I was a flight instructor with, I don't know, about 5,000 hours of dual given. I really enjoyed the teaching process. What I did not enjoy was the lack of money. So in any event, in episode one, we are going to start with the basics and learn how to read an approach plate. In future tutorials, we will cover in depth and in the aircraft, everything from how to fly an ILS, RNP Zulus, localizers, SIDs, stars, you name it. In addition, I plan on doing a series of first looks or tutorials on the aircraft that have come included, not only with Microsoft Flight Simulator, but as the aircraft are released as payware add-ons as the game progresses. As always, the goal is to make this a interactive channel. And so if there's anything you'd like to see that I haven't covered, just leave me a comment down below and I'll get to it. Having said that, let's just jump right in. As an aside, which approach plate should we choose when we're actually doing our flight planning? Well, if we come up and look at Philadelphia Airport, the kind of general rule is the inner runway, in this case, 27 right, is normally your departure runway and the outer runway, 27 left, would be your arrival runway. Of course, Philadelphia does it completely backwards and just local travel knowledge, I will tell you that 27 left is what we depart on, 27 right is what we arrive on for the most part. In addition, if you see there's like wildly um, difference in lengths, for instance, you have maybe an eight or 9,000 foot runway and then a five or 6,000 foot runway, obviously take the 9,000 foot runway. So that's just a quick aside, but now we're getting into the actual approach plate. All right, let's zoom into the approach plate. Regardless if you're using JEPS or LIDOS, there's four main sections. The top is the heading, beneath that is the plan view, below that is the profile, and beneath that is the minimums. Up in the heading, not a lot to talk about. The only thing we wanna make sure is that we have a current and valid chart for the approach that we've loaded up either in our FMS in our G1000, or if you're flying like the traditional six pack, you've got the right frequencies up there. So let's make sure we got the right approach plate. Believe it or not, I know it sounds dumb, but it does happen from time to time where the pilots will have the actual wrong approach plate up or they've loaded up the wrong approach and now they're completely lost and behind why they're not picking up the localizer, the glide slope, or everything's not, is going catawampus on them. So that's all we're looking at for the heading. Okay, as we move down to the plan view, let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit to make this stuff easier to see. Some of the information we're gonna see repeated later in this chart, uh, but the important points are, number one, localizer frequency, 108.95, with an identifier of India Papa, Delta Papa. So you need to verify that you actually have the correct frequency in there, and you either need to see that on your FMS or Garmin 1000, that India, that four letter identifier, or if you're rocking it old school with one of the older planes, you need to physically dial in 108.95 on the nav frequency, turn up the volume, and then listen for the Morse code identifier, which is graphically represented underneath the localizer frequency with the dots and the dashes. Next, 268, our final approach course. Make sure you see that on your FMS or you've got it dialed in in your OBS. Next, MSA, 2,600 feet. That's the red 2.6. Next to the right, you see another graphical depiction where it says MSA, the circle says 25, that's OOD or Oscar Oscar Delta. That's the, the three layer identifier for the Woodstown BOR 26. Once again, that is the altitude of the MSA, minimum safe altitude. To the north, you see the arrow that is the highest of obstacle on the approach plate, 1547. So 1547 rounded up to 1600 plus a thousand feet. That's how they figure out your MSA on your approach chart. Final approach course picks. That is designated by the P, and that happens to be Yalto. We also see it's 6.1 miles away from the runway. And to the right, we see the initial approach fix of Martin and 3,000, and the line underneath it means we need to be above 3,000 feet at Martin. Airport elevation, 36 feet. This is important for us in the airlines because we need to be fully configured 
at 1,000 feet above airport elevation. So by 1,100 feet, we need to be in the fully landed configuration, which means gear down, final approach court flaps are set, on vertical and lateral guidance, basically no more than one dot deflection either way. We need to be on speed, so plus 10, minus 5, and at that point, a sink rate of no more than 1,200 feet. So for us, that's something we need to specifically brief. If you're flying, and I, if you're flying in a jet, highly recommend that's exactly what you have. If you don't have any one of those things, for us, it's an automatic go around. You can get away with a little bit more if you're flying like the light av aviation stuff. But I think, it, once again, real good thing at 1,000 feet, make sure you're fully, set, fully set and ready to land. Um, there's other things. There's some notes on the chart there. You see the very top DME required for a procedure entry. Um, down at the bottom, common ILS DME frequencies for runway 9 left, 27 right, verify, loc, identifier. So you see that a lot. There's also a graphic depiction of the missed approach. That is that blue box that I'm highlighting right now. Straight out 268, 1500 feet, right turn on head of 295 to intercept the 115 to the Medina, which is MXE, and hold. You see the Medina VOR holding procedure. It's got the frequency, 113.2. It's got the actual hold, inbound 054, outbound 234. You see Pottstown up right above it with the identifier, the frequency, and the holding in case they want you to hold there as a backup. There's some other things you can see. I'll circle right here. Northeast Philly, p &E, that's an airport. You have more towers on there. You got a graphic depiction of the river, which is the Delaware, uh, running right through the center of the map. The gray areas are the built up or city areas. But for the most part, I think that covers the most important parts on the actual chart. As we move down to the plan view, we're gonna see a lot of the same information, but just given to us slightly differently. First of all, we see the actual runway lengths. Now, here's one of the slight quirks about the free Lido charts. They're giving us the lengths in meters. So I'm sure all my European and communist friends love that, but for us Americans, 46 stands for the width of the runway, 2702 stands for the usable length of the runway, Below that, we see 3.0, that's the glide path angle. And the two red dots and white dots are the pappies, which, which are located to the left of the runway. Moving over to the right, these are the altitudes and miles. So at 8.9 miles, we should be at 3,000 feet. But as we intercept the three degree angle, at eight miles, we should be at 2,700 feet. 7 miles, 2390. Obviously, Yalto is 6.1 miles, and that's at 2100. And at 3 miles, 1090. So it's just another way to verify that you're actually on path. Once again, to the right of that, we see the LOC, which stands for 3.06. That's the actual specific glide path angle. The identifier, the final approach course, and the runway heading 267. Moving down. We're now into the written description of the missed approach procedure, which is 268, so straight ahead, minimum 1,500 feet, right turn to intercept the 115 radial to Medina, and Medina climb to 3,000. A profile view of the approach. So we see Martin at 3,000. We intercept the glide path angle around 8.9 miles out, Yalto 2,100 feet, and then the missed approach procedure. And here's yet another quirk of these free Lido charts, and that is we don't get all the information that we need. And we'll see this also as we move down to the minimums, and that is the airspeed and rate of descent. We're only given 120, 140, and 160. That's great if you're flying an Airbus or suboptimally a 737, but um, it doesn't help us if we're flying general aviation, right? So. What that's showing us is at 120 knots and 650 feet rate of descent, that will keep you basically on profile three degrees all the way down. As we move down to the minimums, this is where we have other discrepancies, and that is 
the category of the aircraft that we're flying, Cat C or Cat D. And that just re involves the airspeed that you're making the approach at. What we're missing is the category A and B. Category A is 90 knots or less. B is 91 to 120, C and D obviously are 121 to 140, and then 141 to 160. So it just doesn't give you the minimums if you're flying, let's say, a Cessna. Oftentimes, there are different minimums based off the speed you're coming in. And so they're just omitting that. Is it the end of the world? Not really. Um, but once again, it's just a slight weakness of the chart. But as we move down to the minimum section, whether it's category C or D, we're seeing that the minimums are going to be 220. That's what we'd want to put in our barrel or 200 feet, AGL, and an RVR of 1800 or half mile visibility. Here in Philadelphia, we only have a cat one approach. As you pull out other charts, you might see category two, category three. Those are auto land functions, something you'd be using once again in a jet, definitely not in general aviation. Um, if you're doing it in a jet or you know, cat three, that is an auto land only, right? You're not gonna hand fly that down, right? There's a couple other categories. You see cat one, you see a localizer. So you could do this exact same approach, but as a localizer only, which would make it a non-precision approach. We'll discuss that at a later point. You got to sidestep if you need to move over at the last second, what that needs to be. So that is actually kind of the full information we would need to pull off the approach plate. What I think I'll probably do next is just give you a real quick brief, at least how we would brief it, hitting all the highlights. All right, so we've covered a lot of information today on how to read the approach plate. But let's bring it into the real world and brief it up in a methodical manner that makes sure that we cover all the required information. So we're doing the ILS 27 right into Philadelphia. Localizer frequency of 108.95 and a final approach course of 268. 2,600 feet is our MSA and that's located all the way around the field. And the highest obstacle is 1547, about nine north of the center line. Shouldn't be a factor. We have a little over 8,000 feet of runway available to us and the event amidst approach we are going to be straight out, 1,500 feet, right turn, intercept the 115 Medina radial, and climb to 3,000. We want 220 in the barrow, with the minimums being 1,800 RVR or half mile visibility. And that's it. That's all we need to do. Next, we'll real quickly go over the difference in the JEP charts versus the Lido's. Okay, as we look at the JEP charts, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to draw your attention to a couple minor things. And the first one is at the very top, you can see that this chart has not been updated since March of 21. And so I think one of the drawbacks of using the Jeppesen and the Navigraph charts is you're not going to get up to date charts all the time. Yes, they have an updating service, but clearly the Jeppesen products are very expensive. It's why my airline doesn't use them. And so while the charts are up to date, as we look at this one, it's not really, right? It hasn't been updated in about four years. So that's one minor drawback. One of the greatest advantages of JEPS though, is if you look at the very top, up in the briefing strip, everything we need to conduct the approach to either set it up or brief it is located at the very top. We have all of our frequencies localizer frequency, final approach course, final approach fix, minimums, airport elevation, our MSA, our missed approach procedure, and underneath that, all the notes that they think is important to conduct the approach. Looking at the plan view, obviously just minor graphical changes. Once again, all the, this information is going to be the same, whether it's in Shep or Lido, it's just how they lay it out. So the plan view, very similar profile view once again very similar but here when we come back down now we see one of the biggest changes or quirks of course with the Lido system is here we have all of our air speeds rate of descent and in addition which we don't have on the Lidos is time so now we know if you're flying general aviation and you're flying your Cessna and you're holding 70 knots or let's say 90 knots if you're flying a twin or maybe the Cessna Corvallis has a slightly higher approach speed. Now we know we need 
372 or 478 feet per minute respectively, but we also now have some additional information from the final approach fix to the missed approach point, five minutes and 24 seconds, four minutes and 12 seconds. We didn't even have the timing element on the Lido's. And the timing element is really kind of a standard thing you would do as you get your instrument rating, right? You get your final approach fix, you start your timer, you announce that you're there, you're obviously monitoring your glide slope on the way in, but you're also checking your VSI to make sure that you're on path. So once again, is it the end of the world for the Lido charts? I don't think so. It's just additional information that Lido doesn't provide. And then of course we have the, you know, we move slightly to the right and we see we have Pappies on the left with the Mauser lighting system. We did have on the Lido charts a way to identify the lighting system, but of course it's in Lido's own code, which you have to look up. And then of course, once we see the missed approach procedure, once again, straight ahead, 1500 feet, right turn, 3000 feet, yada, yada, yada. And as we move down to the bottom of the chart, we see we now have the two additional airspeed categories, A and B, which are once again, up to 90 knots for category A and then 91 to 120 for category B. So just some additional more information that Lido is emitting. But other than that, they are pretty much compatible. They're both usable. The, once again, the biggest strength, I think, for the JEP charts is the ability to set up everything for the approach, brief the approach at the very top on that briefing strip. But other than that, just a quick rundown of how to read a chart, how to apply the chart in real life. Once again, appreciate everybody watching. Please leave, leave a like, subscribe, and comment, and I will see you all in the next one. Take care. Bye for now.